Now, could you see on the uh, document camera? Okay, today's topic, which what we are going to discuss today about um, the oxidative phosphorylation, chapter 18, oxidative phosphorylation, PHOS, PHO phosphorylation. It's one word, okay, oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, this is a common pathway. This is common, common pathway, the oxidative phosphorylation, okay, common pathway, which is found in all living organisms, all living organisms, all living organisms. Meaning, if you heard the living means they used to use uh, for respiration that oxygen, and sometimes they are also living without oxygen. That is anaerobic condition, anaerobic. But in all these places, uh, all this uh, uh, metabolic pathway, aerobic or anaerobic, they used to perform oxidative phosphorylation in a, in a different way. But if it is oxygen is there, that will, that will happen, but mostly with oxygen. But in anaerobic situation also, they may transfer the electron potential and thereby it may produce ATP or energy without the, respira or without the oxygen consumption. But the production of ATP, either oxidative phosphorylation or anaerobic will be the primary criteria for any living organism. So that you should understand first, okay? Now, if I say ATP, okay, ATP requirement, ATP, how much ATP is required for uh, a person, 70 kilogram male or, you know, person or human being of humans. So it is going to be, uh, these weighing of 154 pounds, right? The weight, I'm just calling the weight of human being. So he requires approximately of 8,400 kilojoules or he may require 2,000 kilocalories. So 2,000 kilocalories uh, per day, that is the, you, are, you need this much amount of energy, right? And the, um, if, you, if you calculate in terms of ATP, how much you require the ATP is around 83 kilogram of ATP. So if you have 83 kilogram of ATP, then you can get this amount of energy. But you are weighing only 70 kilogram. But how can you go for 84 kilogram of ATP? See, that is another question. How do they get it on this 83 kilogram? Absolutely, it is not possible to produce this much amount of ATP in your body. But the amount of energy is being produced. How? You have pr produced per day 250 grams of ATP. This is the amount you are normally producing per day. Okay. But if you have to manage this to how much? 83 kilogram. How? 83 kilogram of ATP by recycling ADP. Recycling. Recycling the ADP molecule. So I, I, the ATP means once used, that is not unused one, you know, I mean, you, or whatever you use, you are not recycling. Then you recover 83 kilogram of ATP. Suppose if you, if you recycle the product of ATP after giving energy like ADP and PI, this recycling of ADP can produce the amount of energy of how much? 2,000 kilocalories per day. This is some uh, calculation which I want to remember how much amount of ATP is required per day if a sedentary person, meaning if he is not doing a regular work, is not like, a, uh, like an athletic where he is burning more amount of energy or hard working or severe exercise. That means you need more. In addition to 2,000 kilocalories, you need more amount of energy and input. 
Okay. So now the recycling. How much the recycling here? According to the calculation, 300 times. Okay, of recycle the each ADP right. ADP one ADP one ADP recycles one ADP recycles three hundred times okay and three hundred times are per day per day okay and thereby it can produce the amount of ATP okay how this recycling is taking place recycling if I say recycling of this ADP recycling of ADP how this recycling is occurring that is interesting phenomena that is today's topic recycling done by oxidative oxidative phosphorylation phosphorylation oxidative phosphorylation okay so the basic question here is to know how this one ADP recycle 300 times per day and recycling of this ADP done by oxidative phosphorylation. Now we are going to study how, okay, how this oxidative phosphorylation is occurring, where this oxidative phosphorylation is occurring, okay, and when this oxidative phosphorylation is occurring how to regulate regulate this oxidative phosphorylation which is occurring inside the cells so these are the questions we are going to answer and if not what all the, uh, the disease are or we can have a, a biomedical importance importance so we are going to analyze in a mechanism in, in, in this class today and that will give you the next uh, round of uh, uh, additional information in the intermediary metabolism. Okay. The, okay. The oxidative phosphorylation. It has been. I just put a short version. Oxidative, like oxidative phosphorylation. Phos n to the power oxidative phosphorylation. I'm just putting a in a short version of abbreviation oxidative phosphorylation. It is by by electron transfer chain. Electron transport chain. Meaning I'll put E T C I put it in a way E T C. I'll abbreviate abbreviate like that. Electron transport chain. So oxidative phosphorylation that will produce more amount of ATP, right? From ADP recycling. And the ox how the what how this oxidative phosphorylation is occurring by electron transport chain and now where these electrons are coming from now I put where these electrons electrons are coming from as I mentioned earlier when you recollect our our earlier class like a like a food or glycolysis pathway glucose or amino acids or fatty acids and they are oxidized and they produce more amount of NADH and H plus and FADH2. So the, these are the one which the result of food oxidation and are from glucose or any other fatty acid or an amino acid through glycolysis or TCS cycle. We got this. This is the we stopped last week about the TCS cycle which will produce more amount of this compound or reducing compound in ADH and FADH2. They are the electrons. These compounds are the electrons. Now, if we transfer these electrons to oxygen, okay, so now, if I say electrons means you should remember about the NADH and H plus and FADH2. In other words, and this is being transferred to oxygen, molecular oxygen. Okay. When the electrons are transferred to oxygen, then the oxygen is going to reduce or more of electronated oxygen or in other words proton 
and join together and it will produce water and this is being uh, removed from our system. So, the, when the electrons are moving to oxygen, it releases the energy, okay? Even these electrons are releasing the energy. And this energy is being used by ADP to form ATP molecule. So, this ADP is being recycled whenever the ATP is broken down from the next step or the energy recovering process. So, again the ADP is being produced, the electrons are moving. So, this is going to like a chain reaction whenever you breathe the oxygen getting to the water. So, the oxidation as well as the, this step is phosphorylation combined together or coupled together we call it as oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. We'll go into the stepwise process, how this process will work on in our system. Okay, the overall reaction, okay, I put it like a NADH and plus half of oxygen plus one H plus, it will produce water plus NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, okay, NAD plus, and also it will produce uh, a delta change in energy, delta G, a free energy change, and that is equivalent to minus 220.1 kilojoule per mole, per mole, per MOL to the power minus 1, that means per mole, are how much? 52 minus 52.6 kilo calorie per mole. So this is a, a, a simple calculation. One NADH molecule is with oxygen, molecular oxygen with the hydrogen, it will produce water and NAD plus and energy. If I say minus means this reaction is the energy is released. In other words, this is called exergonic, exergonic meaning the energy is released uh, and this energy is being used to synthesize the ATP. That's what I want to mention and we are going to see the mechanism, how this energy is released in what form, okay? The overall reaction is an exergonic reaction. Now, if the NADH is going to oxygen, if I say plus oxygen means there are some steps which is involved to reach this oxygen. They are called, we call it as uh, complexes. There are, uh, there are three complex, intermediate, three complexes, okay, present in, present in electron transport chain. That's why I call it ETC. Say when the electrons are moving from NADH, okay, to three complexes, which is present in the electron transport chain. We are going to see the chain now, but these three complexes and what will happen, as I mentioned earlier, through the exergonic reaction, right? Exergonic, meaning energy is released. Exergonic more energy is released, that energy is being used, exergonic energy is being used to transform ADP to ATP. So this energy, this exergonic energy is released, that is being used to form ADP plus inorganic phosphate. So if you provide the ADP and PI in a test tube, nothing will happen. So you need to put more energy and that energy is coming from the NADH and this NADH electron transport through this complex. Where this NADH is coming from? This is coming from glycolysis or glucose or glucose or amino acids or amino acids or fatty acids. Where this fatty acid glucose which is coming from? Food, whatever you eat, food. So now the, you got the ATP formation over here, okay. How this ATP is produced now? I'm going to have some mechanism of this, how this ADP is linked to ATP in the exergonic process. And, and that's the interesting one. Then, uh, uh, when the electrons are moving, okay, when 
electrons, i.e. minus it electrons movement, okay, it produces a hydrogen ion, hydrogen ions across, across mitochondrial membrane, mitochondrial membrane, okay, it goes on a mitochondrial membrane. And if you, if you produce of this hydrogen ions across mitochondrial membranes means one side of the mitochondrial membrane you have more of H plus, H plus more in the, suppose this is the membrane, okay. The other side is the less, that's the hydrogen ion concentration is very less. So meaning across in one side of the uh, membrane, this is the membrane, okay, Mi mitochondrial membrane no. One side is more, another side is less. What happens is gradient, it drives certain high energy potential. If the electron, um, the electron motive force, in other words, um, I'll write it out you know, separately. These electrons uh, unequal, unequal distribution, unequal distribution of hydrogen ion or H plus or proton, it will produce, okay, it produce a proton motive force, proton, because H plus is a proton, right, in chemistry, proton motive, proton motive force, in other words, we call it as PMF, proton motive force. So, how do you get this unequal distribution of hydrogen? Because of the electron movement from NADH to their complexes, it will produce more of unequal distribution of this hydrogen ion of one side of the membrane. That produces a, a proton motive force or PMF, okay? So, now, the next step is the ATP is synthesis. Now, ATP is synthesized, synthesized when the proton or the when the H plus, okay, or proton, H plus, proton or proton or H plus flow from, flow back to the mitochondrial matrix, mitochondrial matrix. Okay, now I will explain to you through mitochondrial ma matrix through through an enzyme mitochondrial membrane through the enzyme complex through the enzyme complex. What is called enzyme complex? ATPase enzyme. Okay, that is. I'll just uh, explain this process. ADP plus PI plus H plus, which will produce what? ATP plus water and it will produce delta G. That means you have a free energy is equal to plus here, plus 30.5 kilo joules per mole, kilojoules per mole. In other words, it will produce plus 7.3 kilo calorie per mole. So, plus means what? You have endergonic reaction, meaning endergonic reaction means you have to add this energy. The energy, energy is being used, E, energy is being used here in this. That's why I put an arrow here. So, the process is endergonic process. This amount of energy is absorbed, uh, this amount of energy is used to form from uh, ATP, from ADP plus PI plus one proton and this the ATP is being produced. So the one process what we did study with an earlier slide where you get the electrons which is a, uh, here this is an exergonic, NADH and three complexes, the glucose and amino acids and fatty acid. The energy is released, and now what? This energy is being used in the another process by the ATPase enzyme. You get 
uh, ATP and, and and this is being the amount of energy is being used to synthesize the ATP molecule. Okay, so that's what it is the uh, the phosphorylation of ADP in presence of oxygen because oxygen is necessary for the electron transport. We call it an oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. The next step of uh, you know in in your textbook 18.1. You have an overview, overview of oxidative phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation. If you see the, the picture, I'll just uh, get into the PowerPoint where you get the, okay, the, these are the one cell and this is the nucleus and you get the green one where the mitomarkers, fluorescent protein, actually this is the actual cell in a fluorescent uh, probe, you get the mitochondria. Wherever the mitochondria, you get the green color. So that's what it is, okay? Our respiration, respiration is taking place now. Now, this is mitochondria here where you get the fuel is getting in and the oxygen is going up and the ATP is being produced and this is the delivered by blood flow, the fuel to mitochondria, okay. And now, the, the membrane here, we are going to see the mitochondrial membrane in a minute and the matrix is the inside the mitochondria, the inner mitochondrial membrane and uh, now you see uh, the oxygen to water and that means the electrons are moving here, like uh, uh, the protons here and then the electrons and, and then it's moving out and thereby you get more of H plus will be there. So whenever the oxygen is reduced to water or whenever the electrons are going to oxygen to form water, it will produce more of the hydrogen which is going this channel uh, to outside the mitochondrial membrane. And then what will happen on the inner membrane? More of, of a plus, proton plus, and the inside is more of the electron is the minus. What will happen is, here, excess of this hydrogen forming a gradient or more of this electron or proton. Uh, normally, what will happen in, in an in a, in a, um, osmosis uh, way, we call it as an in osmosis. Have you ever heard of the osmosis before in your earlier class? Whenever a semi-permeable membrane, uh, suppose if this is a semi-permeable membrane, when a high concentration of the solution or the substance into the lower concentration, the, the electrons or the substance will move from one direction higher to lower, right? You know about that one? So here what will happen, more of proton and here less of proton, they, then they, by, by osmotic theory, the proton is moving towards from higher concentration to the lower concentration. When it moves here and it will use the ADP to PI to form ATP and in, 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 in this is called like a like a chemi-osmotic theory, okay? They call it as chemi-osmotic theory. For chemi-osmotic theory. So that, that's one of the hypotheses. They said how the ATP is being produced. Here more of the chemical ionic gradient, it will come up, okay? And now, this is uh, another electron micrograph of uh, actual mitochondria. If you see, this is the folded one, criste, and this is the outer membrane, and then this is the inner folded membrane, and the matrix is there, and then all these particles which is present there, and they are the respiratory complexes or ATPase. This is the cross section of a of a mitochondria. If you if you slice the mitochondria, then you will find under the microscope in you know, a one mitochondria. This is not a main. It's a one mitochondria, part of the cell, and these are the endoplasmic reticulum over here. These are endoplasmic reticulum. So, we'll go back onto um, the picture here, chemi-osmotic theory. And when the ATP is generating, it's here, okay. Now what, you, you get it, ATP generating process. ATP generating process, okay. During this, an inorganic compound through an inorganic, inorganic, I-N-O-R-G, inorganic compound. What is the inorganic compound? 
that is molecular oxygen that's our respiration right oxygen molecular oxygen so as the ultimate electron acceptor ultimate that is the ultimate electron acceptor acceptor so i put it like that electron ultimate electron acceptor it's a molecular oxygen so this is the we call it as respiration so whenever you breathe what you have your molecular oxygen getting into your lungs and that oxygen is distributed to through the blood to the tissues and inside the tissues is getting into the cells and inside the cells is getting into the mitochondria and the mitochondria will accept this electron and then it will produce more amount of the atp okay this is the process the electron donor okay now this is the electron acceptor i am talking about what is the electron donor here electron donor electron donors electron donor can be of organic organic compound organic compound or an inorganic one or an inorganic one so here the organic compound as i mentioned earlier uh, you we did study earlier so glucose organic compound and then amino acid fatty acids right and all of them are the organic compound which is being metabolized and, and through glycolysis and as well as tca cycle and then it will produce more of the electrons so so whatever you eat you are eating electrons okay that's the e electrons mean that whatever you eat that will be metabolized into more of electrons and that electrons is being used by the oxygen so that's what you have to remember as a biochemist okay now the fuels oxidation of fuels that's what i have given here here oxidation of fuels the fuels okay oxidation of fuels as i mentioned fuels are glucose amino acids and fatty acids that you know very well and now phosphorylation what we have done phosphorylation phosphorylation with addition of phosphate to the compound called phosphorylation and this phosphorylation of what of adp okay and this two oxidation of fuels is one event this is one event and phosphorylation of adp is another event so the event 1 and 2 is coupled or combined together by what proton gradient proton gradient that's what i explained earlier chemi osmotic theory like proton gradient where this proton gradient is occurring across the mitochondria which mitochondria inner membrane not outer membrane you remember inner membrane of mitochondria mitochondria inner membrane of mitochondria okay so that's what the figure which i showed you is in point 1 so in 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 uh, summary the generation of in summary generation of generation of high transfer potential what is called high transfer potential that's what we are producing potential what is called high transfer potential by electrons e minus electrons by what citric acid cycle or tca cycle so how the tca cycle is operating because by glycolysis the end of glycolysis is coming tca cycle where the glycolysis stop whenever you have a glucose or if you consume of more of food glycolysis and that's into the tca cycle and the tca cycle will produce more of the potential that's on the nadh and this is this electrons now entering into what is called the electron transport chain etc which you are going to see it now in a short while and that will produce of the atp and this is called the cellular respiration or respiration in general in presence of oxygen okay so the next question how the eukaryotic oxidative phosphorylation which is occurring in in the oxidative phosphorylation 
um, the organal or the system where we call it as mitochondria, where this is occurring. Right? When I said where this is mitochondria. Mitochondria, yeah. I'll just get in there, yeah. Mitochondria is the is the organal where you get more of uh, oxidative phosphorylation is occurring. Okay. What is mitochondria? It is. I'm just uh, getting a, a, a clue in a couple of minutes of mitochondria. Is a oval shaped molecule, oval shaped molecule, and it has two micrometer length, length, and 0.5 micron meter in in diameter in diameter okay so this is very tiny just like a bacteria okay as I mentioned earlier and the uh, Eugene Eugene Kennedy okay and Albert Leninger Albany US Albert Leninger L E H N I N G R. These scientists they found out, uh, they discovered, okay, the TCA cycle, TCA cycle enzymes, TCA cycle enzymes are present in or present in mitochondria. So this is a very interesting topic. Okay, our respiratory assembly. Also, they found enzymes of enzymes of fatty acid oxidation. Fatty acid oxidation. So, these TCA cycle enzymes are present in mitochondria, and the enzymes of fatty acids oxidation also present inside the mitochondria. That is their discovery. Okay, and what is the morphology of uh, the mitochondrial membrane? It is present in the outside. It's a it's a outer membrane that's in the blue color, and then there is an, an inside a folder of a, what is called inner membrane. Okay, so this is mitochondria. Okay, so the red one is the outer membrane. And this outer membrane, this one, is permeable. The molecules can go in. They can go in. They can go in. Any molecule, they can go in. Okay? It's all the molecules. It's highly permeable. But this one, it is not permeable. That's on, on the inner mitochondrial membrane. They are not permeable for everything. Okay? They're nothing. So you get, there is a, a space in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane where you get the, uh, you know, all these reaction is taking place. Now, at the inside, what you get is the matrix. And the matrix, and they are full of TCA cycle enzymes. These enzymes are present in the TCA cycle membrane. Okay. In other words, the folded structure, they call it as criste. C R I S T A E Criste, the folding structure of this mitochondrial membrane in Criste. Suppose if I I open this uh, one and uh, and then uh, the crinkle or the folded one with the unfold for all of this uh, inner membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, where you have the enzymes and everything, right? So if I open of a, of a one particular, uh, I mean in a, in a species like any human um, beings of um, unfolded I put it like this one okay unfolding unfolding the inner membrane inner membrane if I unfold this inner membrane okay the surface area become all the mitochondria of all the cells all the tissues in our body it will form 14,000 square meter that is that means three football Field. Imagine that amount in U.S. In U.S. football, football field. You know about it. There are three football football field together. How much the surface area? There is around 14,000 square meter, and that is the area which we have it in our system or in our being. So the amount of enzymes, how much enzymes are there, and then how they are 
sprinkle in this is the one mitochondria inside our body there are several and differing upon the tissues the shape may vary and this mitochondria is constantly renewing as well as synthesizing as well as dying this mitochondria and still you have to keep this 14,000 mitochondria to produce the amount of ATP which I mentioned earlier so we need this much amount of, uh, of the cellular energy okay now the outer membrane is quite permeable as I mentioned before and the inner membrane it is not and the inner membrane uh, they have as I mentioned it is not pe permeable inner membrane okay however the inner membrane inner membrane they have the inner membrane they have transporting protein or transporters transporters these transporters, okay, called are pores, P-O-R-E-S, transporting pores. And they, there are some protein or pore-forming protein, pore, the pore-forming proteins. The pore-forming proteins, and they have a molecular weight of 30 to 35 kilo Dalton, KD, K means kilo Dalton. So these are the molecular weight of that protein. So the pore forming proteins and these proteins form pores and the pores will become like a transporters and they are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane and this will, these pores will facilitate, okay, the pores facilitate, facilitate, facilitate the transfer, the trans of metabolites. What metabolites, which I mentioned earlier, the glucose uh, produce more of pyruvate, pyruvate and uh, fatty acids, they put acetyl-CoA, fatty acid, acetyl-coenzyme A, and amino acids, the respective intermediate, and all of them, they've been transported through these pores to where? To inside mitochondria inside mitochondria yeah, that's the inner membrane of mitochondria and then getting into matrix where the matrix you have all the TCA cycle enzymes and then more of the electron equivalents will be produced so ultimately by the result what you have suppose if this is your mitochondria and the outer membrane and I just I, I just uh, draw in a rough drawing of the inner membrane and then now you get uh, uh, I mean the metabolites which is coming all the metabolites is coming up but here you will really selective metabolites is getting in by the pores and then here you have the enzymes so these enzymes what they will do TCA cycle enzyme they will produce large amount of electrons 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 e, e for electrons all electrons being produced inside the inner mitochondrial membrane by TCA cycle enzymes right and then what will happen during this another event which is occurring here that is the mitochondria is the place where your molecular oxygen is getting in okay the oxygen which is coming here oxygen molecular whatever you are breathing it okay this oxygen which is going to be there so the oxygen and this electron and there are certain uh, electron transfer chain intermediates these electrons is pumped out as I mentioned earlier in this cartoon is the pumped out in the more of what H plus protons will be going up when the oxygen is being reduced here and more of H plus more of H plus and here the less of H plus uh, so it, it's a less quantity so it forms a gradient so what will happen in osmotic theory like higher concentration of hydrogen or H plus or proton or electrons to lower side of this proton. Here more of electrons and that is electrons being translated to H plus and this is going to come back here when higher concentration of the lower concentration what will happen here there is a motor called the ATPase enzyme. So the ATPase enzyme will use this energy to form ATP from ADP to ATP. So that's why the electrons are there, oxygen is there and then ATP synthesis also is taking place. So everything in, in, uh, in, in a sequential manner and one depending upon the other and that's what the energy is being produced, okay. Now, we are going to see in a couple of uh, other factors 
like an impermeable uh, membrane of the ions or the polar molecules. That is an inner mitochondrial membrane. That's what I ex uh, explained earlier. And uh, the next uh, level is in the prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are in bacteria. What happened in bacteria? What is the structure of the bacterial? Suppose this is a bacterial outer wall and the inside the bacterial membrane because bacteria they don't have mitochondria. However, the outer cell wall act as a, a I mean, double layer membrane here. There's a bacterial wall, green is the wall and the blue is the outer membrane of the cytoplasm and I'm just uh, going to draw something like an uh, inside the cytoplasm. You are, are, this is the cytoplasm, the red, the, the border membrane. Okay, this inner membrane. So the outer membrane and this the inner membrane. Outer membrane of cytoplasm, inner membrane of the cytoplasm in the red. Here you will find more of the electron transport chains like that, inner membrane. Just like a, a mitochondria, but it's not folding structure. But you have the inner mitochondrial membrane, uh, sorry, inner bacterial membrane on cytoplasm membrane, you have the ETC or the electron transport chain. Okay, and they have what? ATPase enzyme, and it will produce more of ATP, okay, in bacteria for that, you know, for the energy production of this. So the outer membrane is permeable, this membrane is permeable, the outer side, but inner membrane is not permeable. But just like uh, in, a, in, in the human other mitochondria, so the whole mitochondria, uh, sorry, sorry, the whole bacteria will have uh, the electron transport chain. So that's why when you compare to the bacteria to the mitochondria, they look similar. So they also said in a, in a, in a, in a, in a symbiotic way how we acquire the mitochondria means we acquire bacteria. So that is the uh, fascinating uh, evolutionary process we call it as endosymbiotic endosymbiotic event endosymbiotic event meaning the bacteria are there in the evolutionary process small small bacteria is there okay then all in a sudden the uh, suppose in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in the cell and it produces more of ATP molecule Somehow, I don't know how, but if this bacteria is getting inside our system or into the eukaryotic organisms, and then it forms not as a bacteria it looks like, but it will produce more of energy. This is energy is already is making, but this energy is being produced. Energy forming unit. That see that's that's a part of the evolutionary process. So if you compare from bacteria to different organisms, you find some of the bacterial uh, enzymes are we are sharing with the mitochondrial enzyme. In other words, what I will recommend here, um, we have a protein synthetic machinery. Suppose if I protein synthesis, okay. We have a nucleus, right, in the cellular nucleus, and then it will produce protein synthesis. And mitochondria also produce protein synthesis. It will also produce protein synthesis. For this protein synthesis, they form, they need, okay, there are different kind of ribosomes. The ribosomes which will, which will use uh, the amino acids and the tRNA to synthesize a polypeptide. That's what from the nucleus, that's fine. The mitochondria also, you have ribosomes, ribosomes, and it will also produce proteins, okay? Mitochondria also produce protein, nucleus also produce in the protein, inside one cell, in a human cell, okay? But when you see the ribosomes, what are present inside the mitochondria, it is just like a bacteria, in the human one. Bacteria also, they have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, bacteria also have the mitochondria and it's not, not not mitochondria but their function ATP synthesis and the protein also synthesis here so they have the bacterial protein synthesis they use a kind of uh, you know the ribosomes the same ribosomes the amount of the, the molecular weight of the ribosome what are present in the bacteria they are present inside the mitochondria of the humans or, or the mammalian system that's why when you take an antibiotic to kill this bacteria here 
this bacteria, if you put the uh, bacterial antibiotic which you eat or, or take more of antibiotic, that will affect the bacteria as well as the mitochondria. If it in. So in the human mitochondria has also been affected by those antibiotics because of the protein synthesis machinery is being affected. So you have to be very careful when you take uh, antibiotic. That means you are also knocked out certain type of mitochondrial proteins as well. So that's the another point which you have to note. And this is called, in other words, this is called endosymbiotic event. Endosymbiotic event. Symbiotic. You know, symbiosis, the one depending upon the other, that is symbiosis, but endosymbiotic means the symbiotic process which is not present outside but get inside the cell and that's why it is called endosymbiotic process here, okay. So the uh, DNA, now we got uh, the mitochondria is a semi-autonomous, semi-autonomous, semi-autonomous organelle and it has own DNA, mitochondrial DNA, probably you might have studied in your forensic class, mitochondrial DNA and sequencing and everything. So it has its own DNA and it encodes its own RNA, ribonucleic acids it also encode RNA. Uh, also they have a circular DNA, circular DNA as well as the linear DNA. It has both. In the latest invention they said the discovery of the linear, linear DNA also present inside the mitochondria. So the mitochondrial genome now, it may vary from one species to the other. Suppose the mitochondrial uh, in the plasmodium, you know, the uh, malarial parasite, plasmodium, uh, falciparum, falciparum, they contain 6,000 base pairs in the mitochondrial genome. And plants, they have 200,000 base pairs, okay. And human mitochondria, how much is the human mitochondria? Human mitochondria they have 16,569 base pair in human mitochondria. Just so remember that. And the human mitochondria, they also encode this particular DNA, encode how many? 13 respiratory chain, respiratory chain, ETC or electron transport chain or 13 respiratory chain ends or proteins, chain proteins. 13 respiratory chain proteins, okay, they code for that one. And also it produce, I mean, the human mitochondria, they also give ribosomal RNA, R RNA. They encode R RNA as well as the tRNA, transfer RNAs. It will also code tRNAs. And some of the proteins also produce from the nucleated, from, from the nucleus, or uh, nucleated DNA. From the nucleus, I put nucleus. Nucleus DNA also produce for the protein for mitochondria. Protein for mitochondria. So in general, mitochondria also produce its own protein. Also some other protein are coming from the nucleus, the DNA from the nucleus. And uh, the overlapping, uh, the gene complements from between the uh, species you will you will find in your in your uh, uh, picture in your figure 18.4 into your textbook. I just I'll go through that one on this picture. This is the uh, cartoon explaining the matrix and Christe how the mitochondria is uh, you know is uh, the cross section cartoon of the mitochondria inner membrane and outer membrane. And uh, these are some of the bacteria and Arabidopsis plant and Plasmodium protozoan and Homo sapiens. Look at that one of uh, 18.3 where you will find the sharing of uh, the mitochondria here. Uh, mitochondrial, um, the enzyme complex, the common or the genome. Now we can see uh, they, are, they are overlapping. These are the different, these are plasmodiums, the protozoa. Here, uh, Caesosaccharomyces, a bacterium, uh, porphyra, red algae, amoeba, moss protozoan. Look at this, all these are the species and, and these are the coding genes, you know, they are common. So the, uh, the, the pink one is sharing and then the green one are sharing between these species 
and this is also being uh, this particular plasmodium is sharing with uh, this so it's these are the sharing some of the gene encoding from from different species meaning mitochondria is common to all the other organisms too okay and now I would like to get into quantify the electron transfer potential how these electrons are being transferred as I mentioned earlier okay I just want to give you uh, an overview on that one electrons and then the electrons are moving 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 where it will move oxygen okay when it electrons are moving this oxygen what it will produce it will produce this uh, electron motive force otherwise called EMF electron motive force EMF and it will produce what it will produce a proton motive force PMF and this PMF or proton motive force is being used to synthesis for ADP to ATP how we can measure these electrons the electron motive force so one simple experiment which they design actually in your textbook it is there I will just explain the principle behind it and then we will find out it's very easy uh, 18.5 in your textbook uh, actually that is the experiment where the phosphoryl transfer potential I'm just given a, 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 a similarity okay um, same situation phosphoryl transfer potential potential possible transfer potential that is on delta G uh, that means delta G zero dash that means hydrolysis hydrolysis and this is going to be equivalent to electron transfer potential electron transfer potential see when this electron transfer potential is translating into the phosphor transfer potential okay so if I want to study if I know how this electron transfer potential is working then the same way I can translate into the other process too okay so we can consider on an uh, on oxidation reaction just in imagine a compound X and uh, another one is X minus so this form X is an oxidized form oxidized form and this X minus this one this is the oxidized form X minus is a reduced form reduced form because the electron is added to it so when you consider combined together they called as redox couple C O U P L E redox couple this if I say a redox couple means X and X minus so if this redox couple in action meaning if we subject to electron transfer how this electron is moving from the oxidized state into this uh, this reduced state this from this we can measure the electrons movement okay so that is the couple we call it the X is to X minus this is called X and the X minus is a couple now the next step the reduction potential of this couple the reduction potential meaning the 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 amount of electron or the speed of electron or the way the electron is transferred from oxidized into the reduced form we call it as a reduction reduction potential reduction potential reduction potential means the electron movement from one to the other in the couple of this particular couple by measuring by measuring measuring the electron motive force otherwise EMF we can measure it and we can measure it in the sample half cell in a sample half probably you might have remember in a battery cell in a physics class same thing I want to interpret here to to power to see the power of the electron transfer okay sample half cell and this suppose the sample half cell is connected to yeah, a standard reference half cell see one side suppose this is the X and the X minus 
and this is going to be connected to another reference cell, okay? And this is the agar bridge, okay? And then here the solution is being filled, and here you have a hydrogen gas, molecular hydrogen gas, as well as this. And, and, and you, you place an electrode, okay? Just like in a battery cell, okay? We are creating a battery cell here. And here the electrode is another electrode, and this is being connected with an voltmeter. That's, that, that's what the figure, cartoon, okay? So if you connect this, and then if you find out this electron transfer from here to here, the metabolites will, will occur here, meaning the NADH, as I mentioned, NADH and H plus, more of this is the metabolites or the redox potential redox couple. And then here you have a molecular oxygen, which is accepting this electron. So the electrons are moving from here, not the NADH, not the uh, whatever these uh, pyruvate or acetyl coenzyme or nothing. Only the electrons are moving through this bridge and then connect, moving and connecting to this. So from this to here, what will happen when it moves, you will, you can measure the volt or voltage. Maybe the circuit is being connected by these electrons. And the speed of electron, the amount of electron, you get more of the volt, meaning the oxygen is being receiving it here, and this is the acceptor, and this is the donor. So if you do measure this voltage, and that will give you your EMF, electron motive force, in a compound of redox couple. At the same time, here the NADH and the oxygen, that's also electron motive force, but that is can be translated into into your phosphorylysing or, or PMF or, or in a proton motive force to induce ATP synthesis. We will see in your in your table, 18.1, um, you will get more of those one. Here you can see the one molar of the solution, another one molar. Here the electrode, voltmeter, and this is the acceptor, H2 gas, H plus in equilibrium. So at the time of equilibrium, and the electrons are moving, and the electron, the current is, I mean, the circuit is complete, you get a current over here. Now, uh, if I measure this with a succinate and oxygen oxidant, and reductant is alpha ketoglutarate, you get negative 0.67 volt is the E there. Acetate, acetaldehyde, reductant. So FAD, FADH2 reductant. So you can see that all these component, whatever we are having on the electron transport chain, we are going to see in all of them. And you get, you know, positive and negative of this energy. Here the energy is being used, but here the energy is being released, the minus. So these are the exergonic process, and they are the endergonic process are using. In other words, the ATP is being synthesis, and here these electrons are being produced over there. So the standard reduction potential of some other reaction. We are going to see in this particular uh, uh, electron transfer chain in a, in a couple of minutes. So I will give you a break for 10 minutes and then come back and we will see more of this one, okay? Do you have any doubt or any questions? Uh, Victoria. Or in sync orange? No? Okay. I will see you in another five to ten minutes. Yeah. When we talked about the uh, electron motive force, and that is going to be translated into phosphorylation potentials, and uh, uh, the electrons are moving from one uh, substrate or NADH to oxygen, and they form as uh, they move towards, in other words, respiratory chain. Respiratory chain or an electron transfer chain. And they consist of four complexes. Four complexes. In other words, in four stations. Like, a, you know, in a wagon stations in from one place to the other, it moves, right? So in the same way, the electrons are moving, and when they move, it, in, it through the four uh, complexes. And uh, also, it, it, it has like a three proton pumps. It passes through three proton pumps, and a physical link, and also one physical 
link to TCA cycle. TCA cycle intermediate, which is also being linked directly to the respiratory chain. And now, what are all, all the chain carriers, okay? The respiratory chain carriers. In other words, the electron, electron carriers. Sorry, C, C, A, R, R, I, E, R, carriers. In the respiratory assembly of inner mitochondrial membrane, and they are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. They are quinones. Q U I N O N E. Quinones. Flavin, F L A V I N. Flavins. And iron sulfur complexes. Iron sulfur. S U L P H U R. Sulfur complexes and the another one is heme group heme groups of cytochrome cytochrome or cytochromes and another one and copper ions copper ions so they are are all of them you know they are the carriers, electron carriers. Copper ions, heme groups of cytochrome, iron, sulfur, flavins, and quinones. So the electrons are moving from these NAD gates and, and they are moving in the inner mitochondrial membrane. First quinones and then flavins are flavin to quinones and then from quinones to iron sulfur proteins and iron sulfur to heme and then heme to copper ions. And then finally where it will end up? In oxygen the oxygen molecule here at the end. So when the electrons are, are, are reaching over here, then this oxygen is being reduced in terms of the hydrogen to form H2O and that is being released. So we will see how this is being moved in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, that's our next task. Okay, we'll see one by one, complex one. What is complex one? And then I will walk you through into the cartoon, okay? Then it is easy to understand. First, let's go on the electrons move from electrons move from NADH. Okay, NADH is the one which is being produced by the TCA cycle. And uh, this move from FMN, that is the flavin mononucleotide. FMN group. FMN is a group or we call it as a prosthetic group. Prosthetic group. In other words, the prosthetic group are the one, the group present in the active site. Present in active site of the electron transfer or the enzyme. Present in active site of an enzyme. We call it as a NADH, okay, and quinone uh, oxidoreductase enzyme, oxidoreductase enzyme, reductase, okay, present in active site of which enzyme? NADH quinone oxidoreductase site. So the, the electrons move from NADH, and this NADH where it's a TCA cycle enzyme, where the TCA cycle enzymes are present, it is inside the matrix of mitochondria. And the electron transport chain where these chains are present, it is also present inside the inner mitochondrial membrane. So the source is nearby, so the electrons are moving from NADH to the oxidoreductase enzyme, or the, here you call the quinones, NADH to quinone. So movement is NADH to quinone by oxidoreductase. And the oxidoreductase, this particular oxidoreductase, they contain, okay, oxidoreductase, oxidoreductase enzyme, and they have iron sulfur complexes, or iron sulfur, Fe a dash, yes, yes for sulfur. So I put it within parenthesis, iron sulfur 
centers. So this, as soon as the electrons are coming to the iron sulfur centers, okay, so the electrons being, the quinone is being reduced from Q to QH, okay. So the electrons are coming here and then the Q or quinone become QH. As soon as it receives this QH, it is mobile. It can move around. It can go to the next uh, center or, or next enzyme, okay. So this particular uh, event from NADH to FMN, okay, the I mean NADH, the movement, the electrons or proton through the FMN, where this FMN is coming from? This FMN is the prosthetic group of oxidoreductase enzyme. And the oxidoreductase active center or active site, you have a quinone and as well as the iron sulfur group. So the iron sulfur group through this, it will move to quinone reductase or QH. And this process or this complex, the entire complex, we call it as complex one. Complex one. So this you should remember. What is complex one? NADH to FMN and quinone reduced to QH and there is an iron sulfur uh, centers are there. So all the electron transfer is taking place iron sulfur center and through that to quinone. So meaning this complex one now got more of quinone proton or this quinone is being reduced or quinone receive more electron from NADH. And at that time, what will happen? H plus will be produced, and that is if it is present inside the mitochondria, it is pushing to out. That's what I said earlier, and this proton pump, this proton is moved outside the mitochondrial membrane. This first proton, or the first center in the complex one, what happens in the complex one. Now, from the complex one, the electrons or the quinone will move, or the electrons moving to complex two. There. We will see that one in a while and meanwhile we have the TCA cycle enzyme. TCA cycle enzyme like we call it as a succinate dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase. So this enzyme in the TCA cycle, this is also linked to succinate, succinate Q reductase or quinone reductase, reductase enzyme. So succinate dehydrogenase enzyme is linked now to succinate Q reductase enzyme inside the matrix and it will transfer the electrons that is on FADH2 which is uh, succinate dehydrogenase enzyme which will produce more of FADH2, more of electrons towards quinone again. Just like the NADH uh, which is the earlier in the complex one, here the NADH to FMN to form complex one, that is, this is called complex one where the quinone is reduced QH. The same way, the another one, FADH, succinate dehydrogenase enzyme, or the FADH2 will also donate its electrons through the iron sulfur unit, or the centers, to Q and to form quinone reductase, or the QH. Okay, in other words, I combine the one and this complex, this is complex two complex 2. So complex 1 and complex 2 together it goes on the quinone reductase or the QH or the reduced. In other words, if I write a simple equation NADH which will give you uh, a quinone site. I put red for the quinone, okay, Q, okay. And this is complex 1 and the another one, I put another color here, FADH2, it will give also to Q. So, the complex 1 here, this is complex 1 and this is complex 2. So, all of them, this is coming from where? This is coming from succinate dehydrogenase enzyme. And it will also feed the electron to this. And the NADH also, uh, you know, also reductase to this electron. So, you have got the quinones and they are highly mobile on this endpoint and how they will move through the iron sulfur centers otherwise called the FES. So here the iron sulfur center and here also iron sulfur centers electrons are passing through or feeding through this particular intermediate and that is I just put it over there it is being enriched or more of electrons. And once you get this the complex one this is the complex two 
it will move these electrons on mobile it will move to the next level and that is uh, we call it as as you get qh2 this is because all of them is coming up electrons so it's got qh2 and it will move to the next one or the complex 3 okay i'm just writing in another paper okay where the complex 3 with the QH, which is coming off, or the more electrons are coming from the complex 1 and 2, there it will go into Q cytochrome C reductase. This is the another complex. Cyto, cytochrome, I put it worse. Cytochrome C reductase. So this is a complex, complex 3 in the electron transfer chain. So from 1 and 2, the electrons are moving, moving from the quinone and this quinone to cytochrome C reductase enzyme where the iron sulfur centers and they receive this electron and this is the site we call it as a complex 3. And this complex 3, they have what components it is in the complex 3 in cytochrome C reductase system. It contains, this contains cytochrome, I abbreviate cytochrome B. C Y T B, okay, cytochrome B type, and cytochrome C1, okay, another molecule, cytochrome C1, and also iron sulfur unit centers. So it will move through this molecule. The electrons are moving cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, and then iron sulfur units of this component, and these all together we call it as cytochrome C reductase system. Cytochrome C reductase system and this is called complex 3. Now, the complex reduces cytochrome C. At the end, the Q will go into cytochrome C and cytochrome C1. At the end, what you get at the end of cytochrome, I mean the complex 3, you have a cytochrome C. The cytochrome C is now, it is being reduced or it reduces to cytochrome C and uh, it will also produce a water soluble protein on the membrane or the peripheral membrane protein. So uh, cytochrome C is now is being reduced. I put cytochrome C plus H plus R electrons or electrons are moving around. Electrons are accumulating in the complex 3 over here after this process. The yes, cytochrome C system. And now the, from the cytochrome C, this is complex 3. Okay, all of them. And now the cytochrome C is also just like a, like a quinone moiety, it is also highly mobile, meaning it will move. This is also on move, on the go. Once the electrons are there, the cytochrome C is changes its uh, position, it can move. It can move from one position to the other, and that's why we call it mobile. When it moves to the next uh, carrier of electron transfer, and that is called cytochrome C oxidase. In other words, cytochrome C oxidase. Cytochrome C oxidase and this complex, whatever the cytochrome C oxidase when it moves, and this is called complex 4. Complex 4. So now the electrons are more of accumulating into this one. Cytochrome C oxidase are complex 4. Now let us see what happened in the complex 4. Complex number 4. Uh, in the complex 4, you have cytochrome A and cytochrome A3 and three copper ions. The copper ions are present in the complex 4. Okay. It also have a heme iron. The cytochrome molecule, they have a heme iron, I-R-O-M. It's a, uh, a molecular, you know, heme iron. You know, the iron group, Fe, ferrous, ferric, like ferric to ferrous. So heme iron also, and also copper ions are there in the oxidase, the cytochrome oxidase enzymes, active sites. This oxidase means this is the site of cytochrome C oxidase, means the oxygen is binding, oxidase enzyme you have molecular oxygen is binding to this enzyme in active site. And then the molecular oxygen is now receiving these electrons. So now the electrons are moving to this one. Okay. 
See, the previous step, as I mentioned earlier, cytochrome C is a reduced one. It's donating to cytochrome C oxidase. And this oxidase now will enrich of these electrons. And it contains cytochrome C oxidase, cytochrome A, A3, 3 copper ions. Meaning, these electrons are moving to cytochrome A, and then A3, and then 3 copper ions, and then the iron, or the heme iron moiety of oxidase, and where this oxygen is binding to this heme iron, and thereby the oxygen is being reduced. If you remember in your earlier class, whenever the oxygen binding means oxygen cannot bind for any compound, but oxygen is a movement, and, and you know about the, the molecule called hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is the one which will carry oxygen. So the same, the same phenomena, uh, whenever the oxygen you need to bind with any molecule, you have the heme group. That's why in the respiratory complex, we have a cytochrome oxidase where you have a heme iron, and this heme iron is capable of attracting the oxygen and from the tissues or inside the mitochondria, in the inner membrane. The cytochrome oxidase is the enzyme which will bind to oxygen and get this electron, uh, maybe, you know, it's coming attached to it, and thereby the oxygen is converted to water here. So meaning cytochrome oxidase plays a major role in the, at the end point, okay? So we complete the, the complex, complex one, and complex two, complex three, and complex four. So how do you study all these electron transfer in the complex one, two, three, and four? We have a, uh, you know, the method to call it as different type of inhibitors. So you can inhibit the electron transfer to complex one or two to three. We can inhibitor, separate inhibitors. And then complex three to four inhibitors. See, and the molecular oxygen also you have uh, inhibitors. So the, by chemical means, we can stop the electron transfer. And then you can feed here some of the electron and stop here and then feed some electrons over here and then stop here. Up to this, it will come up, but it will stop the electron accumulation and this. And thereby, we can do some experimental, uh, you know, finding uh, certain type of drugs or how the electrons have been transferred. That is the uh, mechanism which we normally do, okay? And the regulation of this oxidative phosphorylation, how this oxidative phosphorylation is regulated, the, or the molecular oxygen is reduced, regulation, of the oxygen electron transfer. How this has been regulated? Whenever there is a need for an ATP molecule, then this is being stimulated. There is no need for an ATP, then the electron transfer won't occur, it will be reduced, I won't do it. So depending upon the need, ATP is being, need of ATP, the oxygen transfer or the uh, or more of uh, electron transfer chain is being activated. Okay, when you calculate the one molecule of glucose, one molecule of glucose, when it is reduced or it is being oxidized or metabolized or catabolized or degraded to pyruvate, and it will produce through the electron transfer chain 30 molecules of, 30 molecules of ATP generator. Okay, also it will produce carbon dioxide, also produce water. So that is the ultimate breakdown of catabolism event. So you, you are producing more of ATP. So if you spend a lot of energy and then what you have to activate more of oxygen and you need to get more of glucose. So that's why, you know, you have to have more of energy. If you take more directly drink glucose solution, you get more of energy, immediate energy, you can, you can get it. So now we want to justify of the tightly coupled, tightly coupled, tightly coupled electrons transport, electron transport, tightly coupled electron transport to phosphorylation. Phosphorylation of what? ATP. So that's why we call it oxidative phosphorylation. That's the definition of this chapter today, right? So where these electrons are coming from again, um, in the summary like that, NADH and FADH2, okay? And they are, the electrons are moving, 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 and then it will produce the molecular oxygen, 
and it will it will change these ADP to ATP okay, at different sites. And this protection of ATP and ADP ratio, they will give you a respiratory control, respiratory control, the ratio of of the ADP by ATP ratios. And you can call the respiratory quotient, or we call it in other words, respiratory control maintained by ADP and ATP. And also you have uh, the electron transport chain, as I mentioned earlier, that electron transport chain is coupled coupled to ATP synthesis. Sometimes if it uncoupled, A -U -N -C -O -U -P -L -E -D, uncoupled by drug, by drugs, if it, uh, for example, you know, some inhibitors, inhibitors, it is not producing ATP, ATP production is not happening. Instead, the uncoupled mitochondria will produce more of heat. But the fuel, more of fuel is there, but the electron transport is not coupled or not producing ATP. But the electron transport is going on, 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 on. Electron transport is going on, but the energy is dissipated into the heat. So when, whenever there is an uncoupling which is occurring, or uncoupled mitochondria. Uh, in, in other words, the, in our body, there is some certain uh, protein. Suppose if you are uh, l uh, going to Alaska, Alaska in a, in a winter time, in a December or even normal time, you have got a cold stress. At that time, what happened? You are the brown fat uh, tissue mitochondria mitochondria there, it will produce more of uncoupling protein, uncoupling, UCP. There are different types, uh, uh, uncoupling protein, UCP 1, 2, 3. So this uncoupling protein will produce more of activation of brown fat mitochondria and that will produce more amount of heat. Okay. So this is one of the adaptations and how we can produce more heat. It is not ATP, but the electron transport change is there, but it will produce more of heat on, on the dissipation. In other words, in those days, they used to, uh, you know, use a DNP, dinitrophenol, a compound, and it will act as an uncoupler, standard uncoupler of my, my oxidative phosphorylation, and they used to have uh, use for weight loss program, weight loss. If you have obesity, if you take DNP, you uncouple mitochondria, and you induce a more of heat, and it is not going to ATP, and thereby you have a weight loss program. But this is very toxic to a human being and it is not being used nowadays, okay? So don't use DNP for your weight loss program. But some of the drugs, some of the supplements, they also add a little bit of DNP in an in FDA regulated one. So please check whenever you take any weight loss program, the DNP should not be there, okay? It's a mitochondrial uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylations on that one. Okay, there are certain, uh, um, you know, uh, other drug which I am interested in this one is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And they act like a, a intestinal mitochondria, mitochondria, it uncouples too. So whenever it uncouples the mitochondria electron transport chain to ATP synthesis, it will not producing ATP instead it will attract of more of water accumulation inside the mitochondria and thereby what happened, suppose this is the mitochondria, normal mitochondria, okay, it's coming in the normal mitochondria and when it uncouples with the NSAID or, you know, painkiller NSAID, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the mitochondria become a, a swelling mitochondria, like not in an oval shape, it became a swollen, swell. And, and you will not get a crystal, so you get more of a, you know, patchy form of water accumulation in there by electron microgram. So this is a part of the research which I did, and I will show you some pictures now. So now you can um, uh, see, I'll just turn off this light so that you will see clearly. And um, so this is, a, you can see the normal mitochondria. Do you see that one? Uh, still you have a glad, I just take out picture I'll show you now. Could you see this one here or still you have it? Yeah, now you can see that. Thank you, George. So could you see the, um, no, okay. 
Okay, now I turn it off now, and now you can see that one here. Could you see uh, the mitochondrial shape here, round? This is a normal mitochondria, uh, you know, in the untreated one in a control cell. Whereas, if I, if I just get, you know, after one hour, after treatment with a painkiller, whatever you are injecting, these are the rat intestinal membrane, what you get here, you can see this one, this is the mitochondria, this is the mitochondria, a part of mitochondria, you can see that one here. You can also focus it a little bit, if I able to see in a closer look. Could you see that one, mitochondria, which is on the empty shelves like this? So these are the one part of the cell, and then you can see the another part where more of endomethacin, whatever the painkiller, it uncouples, totally uncouples of mitochondrial pass violation, and it gives a, 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 a blank. This is a, a peer of electron micrograph, which I did my research and published, and I will give you some references so that you can get some, some additional information for this particular work, okay? Um, now I'm just going back when this uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, and when, whenever uh, the uh, mitochondria electron transport is being blocked, the next one, okay? If I block this electron transfer, suppose if I do these electrons are moving from NADH and then to FA, uh, I mean quinone, and then here the FADH2, quinone, and then quinone to complex cytochrome, see ox, cytochrome C system, and then cytochrome C to cytochrome C oxidase, and then the oxygen. So here, if I stop these electrons here, on the iron sulfur center, FES, iron sulfur center, and then iron sulfur center here. So if I, if I stop here by inhibitor, I can, uh, I can measure this iron because uh, the electrons moving so fast, I have to, uh, you know, add the drug or the endomethacin or, or, or any insert, and then find out I can capture the iron sulfur center by electron paramagnetic resonance. In other words, there is a, a machine, we call it as a EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. And it will capture the free radicals or the electrons movement or the compound of iron sulfur and it gives you a signature of this one, electron paramagnetic. So I published that work and I will, I will walk you through in my elect, uh, an electronic result for this electron paramagnetic resonance paper and, and there you will find whenever the electrons are accumulating in a particular center, I can easily monitor that. And suppose if the free radical are getting into nitric oxide or NO2 or NO minus, and that will accumulate to the heme ion. Where the heme group is there? In the cytochrome C. So instead of oxygen, this, this is going to bind over there and thereby it can block and it induces a, a certain a reaction or the inflammation. And, and this is the one, is a fascinating work which uh, I did earlier, and that's uh, the references, which I'll give it to you in a second, on to the, uh, uh, on the electronic reserve. Okay, let me go over onto my blackboard. Uh, do I have a blackboard here? Yeah. Okay, go to the course content. Course content. If you if you go on to my electronic reserve, and uh, this is the one. Okay, electronic reserve. Other password. I'm going to click here. And there are two papers I want you to note here. Okay, one. Um, okay. Here, this is the one. 2,4-diaminohydroxypyrimidine inhibits the inserts induced in nitrosyl complex in EPR signals and the ulcer in rat jejunum, BMC gastroenterology, this paper. I will show this paper first and then I will go on to the next one. And we will discuss this one. Enter my password and getting the paper out.
from that. Okay. So this is a BMC gastroenterology. Uh, and this is my paper when I published from, uh, I did work in England, but I published in, in UNC Chapel Hill when I was there. And uh, you can go through this paper and it will give you on your clinical perspectives on that part, okay, where uh, the isolation of mitochondria fraction and EPR spectroscopy. And this EPR spectroscopy cost uh, nearly $1.2 million on that particular machine. So I had to work for heavily on this for, a, for a, uh, three to four months intensively and to get the results of it then and I just did. And uh, here you will find uh, the different treatment of uh, this. Um, and just I want to show the picture uh, here, yeah. When you freeze it in a liquid helium uh, below the temperature uh, minus 280 degrees centigrade, you get uh, the electrons, you can freeze the electron, then you can see this is a normal uh, one, and you will find the electrons, uh, the signature pattern of iron sulfur center, okay? And with the indomethacin, you will not find this particular small nick on that part. This is on the magnetic field, and this is number one. On the 8K, this is another temperature settings to measure. And then when we did onto G factors and, and then indomethacin and nabimetron and other control here, the 20K of that particular, after one hour of treatment with the animals, uh, you'll find this indomethacin, you get the signature will go alter. And on 24 hours, you see this one alters here. So this control and the nabimetron is another control uh, by the company here in uh, Glaxo. Uh, welcome and uh, Smith Clean Beecham and they have given the fund for me to carry on the work and they said uh, Nabumotone is good, it is not producing ulcer and we are so suspicious well, how it is going to be possible. So we did on the electron uh, tra um, uh, paramagnetic resonance and we found out uh, Nabumotone indeed it works just like a control and it is not producing any ulcer whereas the indomethacin, yes it induces ulcer and these are the typical signature when you see this and this these are the heme protein where the electrons are accumulating it. So this is a, uh, one of our findings. And here you can find the 24 hours and subtracting the one graph into the other. And this is the, the difference between the, you know, when, when the indomethacin, when you subtract the indomethacin and the control, you find this particular graph. So, so it is uh, uh, one of the research paper. If you are interested, you can go through and that will give an idea how we can use the electron transport chain to find out the designing of a drug, you know. So, and another paper which I would like to go through uh, is that here. I don't know where I'm going here. I want to go to the, okay. Electronic prism, okay. Okay, go back. Okay. Another one which is going on to mitochondrial uncoupling of intestinal mitochondrial phosphorylation. And this particular paper, uh, this is the um, uh, inhibition of cyclooxygenase and the in uncoupling of mitochondria both together to constitute the uh, uh, ulcer formation. And this particular paper is being quoted by Wikipedia of mechanism of action of aspirin. So this is again another uh, paper which is more of citations on it. And this is the one when compared to last time when you did on the hypothesis paper article and this is the experimental evidence or mitochondrial damage, a possible mechanism of topical phase of NZ induced injury. So you can go through this particular article uh, as well as the one which I showed you EPR article, these two articles you can go through that. I mean, this is being, now you can see this is the abstract and, uh, and could you see that, you know, even now they are, they are citing this particular article, opposing effect of nitric oxide and prostaglandin inhibition of muscle mitochondrial. Uh, this is again 2012 and uh, there are a lot of uh, work, these people they are quoting on this, of this particular article because that's the uh, crest uh, in other words, 
That's very interesting finding an in intestinal inflammation, mitochondrial damage, a possible mechanism of topical phase, cancer induced injury to the rat intestine. And this, 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 this is the one which you will, you will get uh, you know, additional information where I'm getting the full article here, full text, yes. I think it is freely available now. There's no need to go into the details because I worth of spending uh, uh, six or seven years to on these two. In, so these are the different uh, uh, non-serial anti-inflammatory drugs to work on this. And these are the experiments. You can see the same thing what I showed you where you have a mitochondria is a normal one circle and now you have the uncoupled mitochondria. And thereby it induces a uh, damage. In other words, these are some of the experiments which we did on this, on the electron transport and bile duct ligation. Whatever the uh, aspirin, uh, I mean, whatever non serial anti-inflammatory drugs you are taking through the mouth, and that is excreted in liver uh, uh, and through the bile duct, it is coming to the intestine and thereby it insult. So through the liver, and it is being more of activated and more of aggravated, and now the intestine is more of uncoupled, and it induces more of attraction for bacteria, and thereby you get the intestinal ulcer, small intestinal ulcer. Uh, these are the first time we are reporting on, on, on this particular article. Okay. So these are one of these uh, authoritative, and, and these, uh, Ingvar Bjornesson is the world leaders in the intestinal inflammation, and he's the professor there in the digestive disease in King's College, London. And uh, I was uh, privileged to work for six or seven years with him, and then um, this is my topic when I, I did, and then I moved from here, from England to United States to work on some other project with uh, bile acid uh, transporting genes later on. But this is the one which is more relevant to today's topic of oxidative phosphorylation, and also I want you to uh, recollect uh, some of the interesting uh, topic in our electron transfer chain in your textbook. And these are um, the electron transport, how the NADH, the complex, reductase complex, electrons are moving. These are the comp this is the complex one and this is complex two, where FADH2 sucks in a dehydrogenase enzyme to ubiquinone. See, all of them are feeding to ubiquinone. And then you have to cytochrome C, where iron, and then here the again it is coming out here and the uh, cytochrome oxidase system here, complex four, oxygen is being reduced. So when the electrons are moving from higher energy level to the lower energy level, so the electrons are released and the ATP is being synthesized. That's what the free energy graph here. Okay. So these are the prosthetic group and succinate dehydrogen, all the system here, complexes, and there the cytoplasmic side are the membrane core. You can see the quinones are there. Now, semiquinone radical, how the uh, molecular uh, electrons are being reduced into the atomic uh, mechanism, you know, these, in the, how these atom, uh, are the electrons are moving into, say, in, inside this uh, molecule and this intermediate. You can see the structure of the flavin mononuclear dinucleotides, FMN to FMNH2, and these are some other stick model. These are the model where the NADH and FMN, how these electrons are feeding to and proton is being pushed out, okay? And these are the other molecular form. And then where the Q pool, where cytochrome C, first half of quinone cycle, second half quinone cycle, these are some other cartoon showing how the electrons are moving from the quinone. And this is another heme, A and the A3, how the heme molecules looks like under this cartoon. And these are the, some other active site where the heme A group, where the uh, molecular oxygen is binding to it. You can see this one, how the copper ions and how they moves from one electron to the other in cytochrome C, oxygen to oxygen binding, and then copper molecules helping the oxygen binding, and, and then the oxygen is being reduced and with, with hydrogen. Peroxidase reaction. And uh, these are the, how this individual complex. This is the whole electron transport chain. Intermembrane space, uh, citric acid cycle produced of section ADH dehydrogenase enzyme, complex two, and this is the complex one. All these electrons are fused to quinone site, Q pool here, and then cytochrome C uh, here, and then here the oxidase reductase, and this is an oxidase where the oxygen is being there. So, so in three uh, pump, proton pump, one, two, three, and it, so due to this electron transfer, the protons are accumulating the intermembrane space, and this is the matrix side. 
and if you accumulate more of hydrogen H plus H plus H plus whenever the electrons are moving then it forms a gradient meaning intermembrane space you have more of hydrogen when compared to here and this gradient will produce a, a, after the uh, membrane separation of this membrane or semi permeable membrane according to the osmotic theory when the electrons or the compounds or the solutes or hydrogen from higher concentration to the lower concentration when it moves towards this from outer to inner it releases the energy that energy is being used for ATP synthesis okay so here are some of the other conditions I mean free radical injury uh, from these are some other conditions where you get the uh, oxygen or free radicals being produced when if this oxygen is not being reduced or excess of oxygen you get the H2O become H2O2 more of oxygen will be there and that will produce more of uh, a free radical damage and that free radical may be affecting uh, to the neighboring cells and produce a disease atherogenesis, emphysema, bronchitis, bron Parkinson disease and muscular dystrophy, cervical cancer, liver disease, diabetes, renal failure, Down syndrome, cerebrovascular disorder, ischemia, repercussion injury. All of them are, are the clinical conditions of free radical injury and especially coming from the wrong oxidation of mitochondria. So the next part, this is the oxidation reduction reaction where you know it is producing a more of uh, H2O2 and the H2O2 is a substrate for catalase enzyme. It should be properly removed the peroxidized to a water. If there is an inhibition of this free radical, what will happen? The free radical will damage the DNA and thereby it induces mutation and form different uh, disease condition. So these are some other mathematical which is not, I am not going through. Uh, it is not necessary for you. Now these are the different uh, animals and, and, and uh, how they are sharing these particular cytochrome C oxidase and reactions. And this is the higher, as I mentioned, higher H plus and the lower H plus, how they are accumulating the proton outside of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And now this is again another cartoon with the, uh, with the ATP synthase. How this is, the, this is the ATP is formed. This is the, like a molecular rotor when the protons are moving inside. This, this is going to be change the rotor and it produces more of ATP molecules. This is the complex of ATPase enzyme which is present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. F1 here inside the membrane, F1, F1 and F0 and the F1 is present inside the matrix and this is present in between the membrane. Okay. ADP plus PI, beta covalent and ATP, this is the ATP synthesis uh, mechanism and uh, and this is a molecular rotor. I mean, this is very interesting how the ATP and this other subunit to form ATP. And these are the recent uh, uh, finding with, uh, you know, different molecular rotor. How this, the, how this, the rotation of this molecule. These are the protein molecule with the different subunits. That's all. Don't worry about it. Now, how this acting flame. This is our muscular, muscular movement. Well, the ATP molecule is hydrolyzed to ADP and PI in a muscular movement. An example aspartic acid subunit how this uh, cytoplasmic half channel how this channel is working I can see that how this oxygen uh, I mean uh, proton from the outside to the inner side through the motor it's going through this side okay so it cannot rotate the clockwise so it will rotate only one side I'll say when the whenever the proton is going through this pores of inner mitochondrial membrane it will rotate so it is not moving it is rotate it's something like a dynamo you know, whenever there's a, a middle of a, a copper wire, a middle is you have a, a magnet and, and circulated by a copper wire. Whenever there is a, a movement of this copper wire, it will induce the electron motive force. That's what we have a power generation, right? A dynamo process. The same thing which is inside our body is a dynamo and the electron motive force is there. Now you can see that how this ATP is, is rotating it from one side to the other. The proton motive force, the are three or four complexes and how they are linked or coupled to ATP synthesis. Now you can see that they are coupled, cytoplasm matrix. Again the same thing what we discussed earlier, how they are linked with the ATPase uh, synthase as well as the um, TCS cycle linked to mitochondrial membrane. And how the ADP molecule is being, you know, bind here and then the aversion is going upside down, this cartoon, how the ATP synthesis and then is going back, cytoplasm side. 
This is interesting to watch. Okay. And this is again another stick model. ATP malate citrates and how they are inner mitochondrial membrane transport with a different transporter. This, as I mentioned earlier, matrix, there's inner membrane. They are impermeable, but they have a porter transporting or pouring protein or porins. The proteins are involved in transporting the carriers molecule. And these are the steps involved the ATP that the glucose molecule is being produced to ATP. How many ATP is being produced? This is some of the economics of energy or the energetics, in other words. ADP added, supply of ADP. This, this is easily we used to do in a research lab. If you add ADP, more of oxygen is consumed. You can draw a graph in, in, in a time scale, XY graph. You can do it. That's why we did. And uh, these are the you know, matrix side, how the ATP proton gradient is linked again, another cartoon. Fatty acid activate the UCP channel, uncoupling protein, UCP1 channel. So that's why it, it, it dissipates. There is no ATP formation. Mind it, this motor is not acting. But the electron transport is working very well. That means it uncouples the phosphorylation to electron transport and it will produce more of heat. Now you may wonder, what is heat? Okay, what is heat? Heat, how the heat is being produced. I want to think uh, a, a different way. How we have observed in physics the process, how many, the matter may present as a solid, the matter may present as a liquid phase, or the matter may present in a gaseous form. Is there any other state we have uh, in, in the, the uh, matter? Matter is the solid form or liquid form or gaseous form. Anyone? Plasma. Victoria? Plasma. Plasma. Wonderful. So this is the latest one, right? Matter can exhibit in a plasma say, right? Could you explain this? What is plasma? What is plasma? What is the state of plasma? It is not liquid, it is not gas, and it is not solid, right? But, but you say plasma. Yes, I agree, totally agree with you. In physics, yes, that's a plasma state. Meaning it is an energy level, right? I put it like a, like a hyper energy level. In physics, you said plasma. In biology, we don't have this phenomena as a plasma yet, okay? But if you see on the uncoupling of the protein, which will produce heat, in my hypothesis, my own hypothesis, Dr. Soma's hypothesis, you can, you can quote that one, okay? It can produce the heat, the plasma. So in other words, we are doing some research, like in our system, mitochondrial uncoupling, mitochondrial uncoupling, harness the plasma state and it will produce energy as heat. So we observe heat, no doubt about it, we observe heat, no problem. Whenever you get a, a fever, you don't have a ATP synthesis at the same time, mitochondria is producing more of uncoupling, more you have produce of heat. How do you get fever? How do you get a temperature rising up in your body temperature? biomedical point of view. Nobody knows. But if you, if you put the plasma, I put it as a bioplasma, a new term. If you incorporate this, then it makes sense. It is another state of the matter which will dissipate into the energy towards heat energy and that's why we feel heat. That makes sense? We don't have any experimental evidence. We have to prove it on this plasma state in our body. So that is a, a next century question. We are going to solve the problem, okay? How we are going to get it. So we are going to uh, determine in a different way and people may think that we are crazy about it, but somehow we can get into the problem later on. We, we are working on it now, okay? So this is uncoupling protein, and we have experimental evidence now. And uh, the next one um, on this slide, 
this is a, a normal resting stage and and the, this is the PET scan of the positron emission tomography computer scan uh, computer tomography like he called it, we call it as a PET 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 scan CT scan you know about the positron okay so this one we are uh, uh, labeling are you getting it on that could you see that one here are getting the okay so the PET scan where you are going to label a label or the fluorescent labeling fluorescent fluorescent labeling of glucose glucose molecule and whenever there is a glucose molecule is hyper you I mean it is used completely and then getting into the mitochondria and then it releases the carbon dioxide it will it will get uh, like this and in other words uh, during the uncoupling protein UCP uncoupling protein UCP which is be is being released when whenever there's a cold condition okay whenever cold and you to releases the UCP and the UCP is uncoupled mitochondria and you will get the fluorescent is label which is coming out so the normal resting condition is fine if you expose to cold you get this, you know, you get more of the heart and then, then iota and then your, you, you, all your neck and then your shoulders and all of them, all this muscular or the brown adipose tissue. In other words, we call it BAT, brown adipose tissue. They become more of heat generating process. So this is ex exclusively you can see in this picture, computer tomography. So this is something like, uh, you know, in day to day life you are going to see in a biomedical imaging fact, you know. So we can, you can, we can study even cancer they are studying on this particular uh, using this probe. Um, this is a very interesting one for you to understand, okay. And now the next one is the what are the inhibitors blocked by rutinone? Complex one uh, in the electron transport chain blocked by rutinone and amytal. And then when you, you, you let these electrons flow and then you add uh, blocked by antimycin A up to the electrons is coming to the complex one as soon as it reaches the complex two it stops electrons will not move against over here and then if you if you leave all and then you add uh, the elect uh, this particular uh, inhibitor like a cyanide or ni azide ni n3 is azide or carbon monoxide the cytochrome C oxidized to oxygen is being blocked because the cyanide attract more oxygen, acid attract more oxygen, and carbon monoxide attract more oxygen, and the uh, cytochrome oxidized to oxygen, the molecular oxygen will go here, and it is not being reduced. So that's why whenever the cyanide poisoning or in toxicology or any, if you consume any cyanide or acid or carbon monoxide exposure, that is inhibiting the cytochrome C oxidate to oxygen and ultimately you are going to die. So that's why you have to be very careful. You cannot smell like carbon dioxide, you cannot smell or any other carbon monoxide, it is a waterless gas, just like, you know. But it contains a more of affinity towards hemoglobin than to oxygen. Whenever you consume more respiration or taking off more carbon, di carbon monoxide, then the oxygen also there, but oxygen will not bind, but carbon monoxide will bind competitively more fast, severe, act quickly to him, and thereby it blocks the oxygen binding to hemoglobin, and thereby you will not find oxygen and you are going to die. And the same thing with the cyanide, if you inhibit cytochrome C oxidase, uh, uh, the, this particular path of the electron transport chain, and thereby no molecular oxygen is available, and cyanide is blocked, and thereby cyanide poisoning. So you have to be very careful whenever you, you, you are dealing with some toxicity or toxic compounds. And rutinone is also a poison. Amital is a poison. Amital is normally present in certain uh, mushroom. So you have to be very careful. And the, the antimycin A, this is another compound which is also blocked. Okay. And this is a, a dinitrophenol, DNP, and these are the compound which is the uncouplers. Uncouplers are pretty much safe. That's why you are consumed with the aspirin and other thing also, other non anti-inflammatory drugs, and they are, they are again uh, uncouplers, but they are quite safe, but it induces some ulcers. But, but the, combined with the DNP, combined with the aspirin, then it induces the ulcer. That meaning cyclooxygenase inhibitor and uncouplers both together to induce uh, uh, ulcer, intestinal ulcer. When you go through those papers, you will find out, okay? And uh, these are some of the proton gradient. 
that's what we have it under ultimately after the electron transfer chain it may induce us to electron potential to produce energy or heat production or NADPH synthesis or ATP synthesis, flagellar rotation or active transport. So the proton gradient is the central part. So it directs wherever there is a need for our energy. So in my opinion, the proton gradient will act through the plasma, what you are talking about, which the no textbook is being revealed yet. Because we don't know how to capture the plasma. In physics, you can capture the plasma. Here, the scientists are finding difficult to find out in bioplasma to maintain. So this plasma will definitely will throw a light how we can manipulate that plasma. But in yoga and meditation and other esoteric school, they are talking about that, but without any experimental evidence. But now we are getting some evidence, but still we couldn't find out how to measure this process how they are being directed towards the one way or the other. Because the people, they are living with a reduced food for live long. How? Because they are working on this proton gradient reversal of that. Even with uh, you know, less amount of uh, breathing or respiration, they can change the electrons or the, uh, or, or, or the consumption into the bioplasma and thereby they can direct and cure certain diseases and everything. But whatsoever, there is no experimental evidence. That's what we want to study now. Okay, these are some other oxidized and uh, reduced state, in a, you know, if you plot a graph. And uh, this is again ATP triophosphate, again ATP synthesis mechanism. And um, also I want to uh, check onto my, um, here, uh, mitochondrial fission and fusion. This is uh, again August uh, 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 science article here, okay. Could you see that one? So mitochondria is the complements of mitochondrial function by fusion. How this mitochondria is being, uh, you know. here, this is the damaged mitochondria and this is the healthy mitochondria, in other words, okay? And it can switch from the one side to the other. This is the one, uh, highly healthy one. And whenever, as I mentioned earlier, this mitochondrial stress, the mitochondria may also undergoing stress Okay, so whenever there's a stress, various insults can cause damage, a type of damage to DNA, protein, and lipids, and also the problems caused by damage is loss of metabolic function or ATP synthesis may be blocked, and the F1 ATPase, that's also being affected, and more of reactive oxygen species, and these are some of the cellular responses to damage. And what is the cellular response to damage? I'll just uh, focus it if you want to see in a, in a higher level. So the DNA repair mechanism will be affected, proteases will be affected, lipases will be affected, mitochondrial unfolded protein response, and the mitophagy and apoptosis. Apoptosis is the cell suicide. Ultimately, if the mitochondria is damaged, the cell will commit its own suicide. It doesn't want to stay for a long time. So that's the, this is the cartoon, which you can, uh, you can see how the uh, mitochondria uh, function uh, decide yeah, fate are the cells, okay? These are the things, you know, debris and secretions and mitochondrial maintenance, the cycle. And if this mitochondria is being damaged, mitophagy, meaning the mitochondria is being engulfed by the other proteases lysosome and thereby it is degraded and thereby it is going to die or it is going to be, you know, removed from the cycle, okay? And uh, this is again mitophagy. This is another cartoon how the mitochondria is being uh, in a step by step or uh, the damaged mitochondria is removed from our system and this has been published in the last month at August 31st 2012 in science magazine and and this is a very interesting article like a mitochondrial fission fusion and stress okay so we did some research on the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and how we are inducing stress to the mitochondria and thereby we, uh, you know, we encounter the intestinal ulcer in our system, our small intestine, okay? So that's our medically important point for you guys. So do you have any questions from Victoria or in Sugarland? 